Hi, I'm Phil Harwell, and this is my 42nd video to discuss the 1950s British science fiction publishing. As I mentioned in a recent video, following the resignation of H.J. Campbell in order to pursue his career as a scientist, E.C. Tubb became the new editor of Authentic Science Fiction magazine in February 1956. So, in this video, I'd like to talk about its closing years under its final editor and in particular about the magazine's best serialised novel, Dead Weight. Best serialised novel. In his short tenure, Tubb greatly improved the magazine. He reduced the number of scientific non-fiction articles favoured by Campbell and increased the fiction in number of interior story illustrations. He also improved the fiction. He obtained several stories by such leading American writers as Isaac Asimov, H.L. Gold, Robert Silverberg and A. E. Van Vogt. Here we see Van Vogt, famous American author. Van Vogt. Isaac Asimov was in number seventy-eight. As I'm off story. Bear with me. Page seventy two. Let's see. I think as I'm off. Silverberg was in number 82. Bear with me. Page 49. Yep, Robert Silverberg, who became very, very famous American author. Still is illustration for his story. And Tubb uh, also maintained this high standard of British contributors by adding rising star Brian Aldous to his roster of top British authors who included Sidney J. Bounds, John Burke, Philip E. High, J.T. McIntosh and others. Now John Richards had left Hamilton's to join Corgi Books, but Tubb was able to recruit new cover artists from his publisher's revivified Panther Books line. His magazine's covers were therefore uniformly excellent, as we can see from those covers there. Now, whilst discussing Tubb's editorship of Authentic, I should like to take this opportunity to debunk the persistent myth and lie entrenched on the internet that he once wrote, quote, an entire issue of Authentic, including the letter column. This is nonsense. The most stories that Tubb ever had in a single issue was four, achieved in number 66, 67 and 68, which still left several stories in each issue by other authors. For example, as we can see here in issue number 66, look at the contents page, there's four stories there by Tug, but there's clearly three stories there by real authors, Ken Bulmer, John Brunner, and Robert Presley. So whilst uh, Tub edited and answered all the letters that were written by real readers. 
Notwithstanding, Tubbs' contributions to Authentic were pretty impressive. In the 20 issues that he edited, Tubbs published no less than 39 stories, of which only three were under his own name. This was because of the then convention that it was just not done for magazine editors to be seen to buy and publish their own stories. But operating under his limited budget of £100 an issue, Tubb had little choice. Now in issue number 68, April 56, this had a special meaning for me because it contained a letter from my 14 year old self, my first appearance in a professional science fiction magazine. But at the time I didn't appreciate it because my original letter had been rewritten and cut to ribbons. Here we see the letter which greatly embarrassed me at the time. A letter from a young reader. You see there. Amongst the excised material was a plea for the editor to commission new stories by John Russell Fern. He'd been absent from Authentic because of his Sky and Exclusivity contract, but that had now expired. My truncated letter now read as if it had indeed been written by a very naive young reader. Instead of the precocious and perceptive young man I then fondly imagined myself to be. But I was really mad at the editor not least because he also misprinted my address as 20 David Street, Ward's End, instead of 26. But that had probably been my bad handwriting. I little realised that many decades later, I'd be an editor commissioning stories from Tub for my own magazine and that he would become a respected friend and client. This issue, number 71, is a favourite with American collectors on account of the fact that E.L. Blandford's cover was clearly based on a photograph of Ronald Reagan, later to be associated with Star Wars defense, space defence program when he became the President of the United States. Space cover and Ronald Reagan, forever associated with Star Wars. And speaking of stars, my daughter, my granddaughter, Eleanor King, recently obtained Star Plus qualifications for university in all three of her university subjects. Remarkable as well. Now, Tubbs Authentic published only one serialised full-length novel, Dead Weight, in 1957. It was spread across three issues, 78, 79 and number 80. Actually written by Tubb himself, it was published under one of the 16 pseudonyms he used in Authentic, Douglas West. Knowing that he had written an especially good novel, Tubb changed the magazine's pocketbook format. You see the change in size there, formerly pocketbook and now standard magazine size. It featured a superb illustrative cover painting by the great artist Josh Kirby, who also provided many of the black and white interior illustrations. First episode of the serial. The interior illustrations by Kirby. Continued in the next issue. Episode 2. Again illustrated by Kirby. Full page interior illustrations. And the 
is the concluding episode of the story. Now we can see the illustrations were credited to someone supposedly called a dash, but that was just a, a pseudonym as a cover for Josh Kirby. And there's the, the final illustration. And also, incidentally, the second cover, that's also by Kirby, illustrating Tubbs' novel. This serial had all of Tubbs' early exuberance and plotting panache, but it was now buttressed by following strict rules of logic. These events were both character-driven and logical extrapolations of the events being posited. It was set in the latter half of the 20th century, following the perfection of a longevity serum. Mankind is now potentially immortal, but the discovery brings with it the grim problems of lack of food and living space for the increased population. Cities become like rabbit warrens, and the old social order is on the point of collapse. To safeguard the younger generations, those who, who have taken the serum or thereafter declared legally dead and have to live on the savings or the charity of their own families. The growing dead weight of these non-productive consumers is causing tensions between the East and West. The, no the novel describes the international intrigues and nationalist tensions, which is suddenly complicated by the accidental release in New York of an artificial disease a deadly bacteriological weapon. Sam Falkirk, as captain of the World Police stationed at the World Council building in New York, is caught up in the investigations of the plague. He already has his own personal problems, being unable to marry the woman he loves because the marriage would bring with it the economic burden of a large family of long-lived dependents. But Sam has a special interest in investigating the sudden and inexplicable death of Angelo Augustine, the brother of his girlfriend. A messenger employed by the council, Augustine, was also a spy in the pay of Senator Rayburn, a fanatical nationalist who was fighting both to retain his power and to destroy the Orient before, as he believes, they turn against the Western Hemisphere. Augustine had died whilst delivering a parcel containing a statue of a Buddha for an employee of Senator Sukumari of the Japanese legation, and who in his own way is as fanatical as Rayburn himself. Sukumari wants to gain living room for the teeming millions of the Orient, and his secret plan involves the releasing of a deadly bacterial plague across the Americas. The bacteria is contained in a special coating on the Buddha statue, but when the statue was stolen by a petty criminal, millions of people hover on the brink of agonising death unless Falkirk can find a criminal in time. In a specially commissioned memoir that can be found in my book, Vultures of the Void, The Legacy, Tug told me to save the void, the book, and Ted Tum wrote a memoir for me, which you can see here, describing his time at uh, Editing Authentic. I'll just quote it. In March 1957, the magazine changed size and format in a bid to attract the larger readership. With less pages, it still carried an average of 50,000 words of fiction, plus extra artwork, the editorial, feature article and book reviews, but still operating on the same budget. The editorial, book reviews, answers to any letters, and various feature items were all part of my editorial duties, and at times I also had to include fiction of my own both in order to fill out the magazine and to remain within the budget. The hoped for surge of sales did not unfortunately materialise. 
and as an economy measure, interior illustrations were dropped in September of the same year. Not having been published under his own name, Tubbs' authentic serial did not see subsequent book publication at the time. However, his first agent, John Cornell, did place it in overseas Italian translation as Pesso Morto, complete in the magazine Romanzi del Cosmo in 1957, where it appeared under his own name, and it was reissued in 1961. In 1959, it had also appeared in the German magazine Utopia 61, but this time is by Douglas West. But in 1979, Tubb completely rewrote the novel as Death Wears a White Face, published as a Robert Hill hardcover, which was seen here. The names of most of the characters were changed, and the book was scientifically updated. In the original, an overpopulated Earth had built a conventional spacecraft in order to reach and colonise the planet Venus. But by 1979, it was known that Venus was actually a hell planet which could never support human colonists. Tug cleverly updated this by the development of the portal, a faster than light matter transferer by which human colonists could reach the planets of the nearest stars. The Hale book was subsequently translated into German in 1984 and publishes a new novel by Pavel Morwig. Now, when Tub asked me to become his literary agent in 1999, as well as finding publishers for his unpublished and new books, I systematically set about restoring all his best order books to print. Some of my earlier videos have briefly touched upon this aspect, but I haven't so far looked at dead weight a.k.a. Death Wears a White Face. By 2005, I'd managed a firmly established tub with a major UK publisher, Ulverscroft, and he became a regular in their Linford Lodge print series, Western and Mystery Libraries. I was able to smuggle numerous science fiction novels by my clients into their mystery line by retyping and submitting them as word files rather than by submitting actual copies of the earlier book editions because that would have identified them as science fiction. I also changed some of the more fantastic titles, hence Tubbs' 1952 Sky and novel Alien Universe became the more mysterious The Green Helix in 2009. So I was therefore inclined to submit the Hale edition of Death Wears a White Face to Ulverscroft because it didn't require any changes, saving myself a lot of work. However, I didn't have a spare copy and soon discovered that the book was both scarce and expensive. Hale was predominantly a publisher for the library trade and the book's small print run had served to make the book a rare collector's item. When I phoned Ted to ask if he had a spare copy he could send me, he told me that he didn't but remarked that he now regretted his revision of Dead Weight. He considered the first version was better. At the request of his then agent, as well as updating the scientific, the unscientific ending, he also revised the whole novel, adding sexual elements and keeping with the new trends in modern fiction. Whilst the origin was acknowledged in the prelims, See here. Bear with me. To have acknowledged its origin. But the changes were so extensive in this edition that it was essentially a new book.
Two was the lightning with modern vision and restoration of their weight, which I did by simply patching in the uh, ending, changing the ending to the interstellar portal to Alpha Centauri instead of the spaceship to Venus. And all of us Croft were happy to buy it. Here we see the splendid first plus edition. Going forward, Ted and I decided that it would be this third version that would be reprinted in future. Next, I was pleased to quickly sell Italian rights, which we see here, to uh, Hugo Malaguti, the Italian publisher. The Overscroft edition is reprinted in Italian. And the publishers asked me to provide them with a bibliography, if two, which I did. There he is. It's a complete bibliography of all of his novels and a selection of some of his covers for his books. Very nice Italian edition. Now the dedicated tub fan, and I know there must be many of you out there, really needs all three different editions of this story. Its original appearance in Authentic, with the two Josh Kirby covers and the interior illustrations. The Hale hardcover edition, is set to become increasingly rare and expensive. The copies infrequently appearing on air books will cost you around £50 in any condition, and already I've seen three figures being asked by dealers for fine copies in dust wrapper. The Lindford Mystery Edition of 2007 was limited to only 1,000 copies and produced for the library market. It was sold on a now expired seven year license, so nearly all copies being offered online now are likely to be ex library copies. And now that Overscroft have terminated their Linford Mystery imprint and are no longer licensed to sell unused copies direct, this edition will also become a collector's item if it hasn't already. The Orient Science Fiction Gateway ebooks license for some 50 or so standalone tub science fiction novels has expired, along with the largely unused book rights. They've been sold to Wildside Press in America. So for anyone with shallow pockets, the obvious answer will be to watch for the forthcoming new Wildside editions. They're currently being reprinted in paperback, hardback and ebook, and selected titles will also be appearing as audiobooks, beginning with the Green Helix. The good news is that just this week I returned proofs of dead weight. So as of August 2022, some 16 titles, which you see here, have already been reprinted with dead weight now due out in just a few days time and all the rest are set to follow. Now many of Tubbs rarest books of the 1950s which have never been reprinted in book form for 50 years are now appearing from Wildside and they include uh, such titles as Alien Impact, Atom War on Mars, 
the Hell Planet and Planetoid Disposers Limited. And several of them, as you can see, have excellent Montana covers.